Hello and welcome to Wilson Center Now, a production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. I'm John Molesky. My guest today is Duncan Wood. Duncan is the Wilson Center's Vice President for Strategy and New Initiatives. Duncan is also a senior advisor to the Mexico Institute. He joins us to discuss a new report released by the Supply Chain Initiative titled The Mosaic Approach, a multidimensional strategy for strengthening America's critical minerals supply chain. Duncan, welcome back. Thank you, John. It's great to be with you again. So, you know, regular viewers know that we've been talking about this and building toward this moment of the report's release for some time, but we won't assume everyone is is up to speed. So if you could give us the summary of about the initiative that led up to the release of this report. Absolutely. So, I mean, let's go back to uh, sort of the beginning of the pandemic uh, more than a year and a half ago. And, you know, the uh, the problems that a lot of us experience actually on a daily basis of trying to get hold of basic goods. Um, going to the supermarket, seeing empty shelves, and revealed all of these weaknesses in the uh, in in America's supply chains. And from that point on, the U.S. government began to focus on actually understanding where these choke points were in the supply chain, and understanding how they impacted upon the United States' competitiveness, on well-being of citizens here, and ultimately upon our geopolitical presence in the world. Um, when we saw the transition from the Trump to the, uh, uh, the, the Biden administrations, uh, we saw a, the launch of a 100-day review by the Biden administration, uh, a review of America's supply chains, trying to understand uh, exactly where we were and to come up with ideas for addressing the vulnerabilities in America's supply chains. And part of that uh, review process was a call for greater stakeholder engagement. Here at the Wilson Center, we decided that uh, we could play our part in that, uh, that engagement. So we convened high level um, stakeholders, uh, first of all, in the critical mineral space, along with experts and Wilson Center uh, staff to come together and to discuss over the period of two months, how uh, America's critical mineral supply chain looks today what the weaknesses are, and to put forward some ideas about how we could make that supply chain more resilient. Duncan, you talked about uh, empty shelves in the early days of the pandemic and really continuing to today. Uh, People understand when things like toilet paper or disinfectant are in short supply. But when we're talking about uh, critical minerals, where does the rubber meet the road in that regard? What are the types of products that are affected by a slowdown in the supply chain of critical minerals? Well, this is where the supply chains conversation has a direct overlap with the climate change and energy transition conversation that we're seeing. And of course, it's a great time to be talking about this with COP26 just around the corner in Glasgow. And what we're seeing is that increasingly um, auto manufacturers who are trying to get hold of lithium, cobalt, nickel for um, electric vehicle batteries um, uh, are, are facing shortages. And what we're seeing is the fact that uh, it's the Chinese who have dominated not just the extraction of these critical minerals and others, but also the processing, the refining of them, and ultimately turning them into the products that we now need increasingly on a a daily basis. The other aspect of the, uh, the energy transition and climate change, which is directly relevant here, is that some minerals that many of us wouldn't think of as being critical, like copper, are in fact something that we desperately need. If we're moving towards an increasingly electrified economy, we're gonna need a heck of a lot more copper than we have access to right now. Uh, That means that we need to make sure that the United States has access to those things. And lastly, um, the rare earth elements part of the equation. Rare earth elements, which is uh, between 25 and 30 uh, minerals that uh, are, are abundant actually uh, around the, the earth, but whose production is concentrated in China. They have been in short supply. And of course, we use them more and more in things like our computers, our iPhones, etc. And they're very, very important for many of the applications that we also see for uh, renewable energy and the energy transition. So this is where we are. Um, it's not just about the challenges that we have right now. It's about looking ahead and thinking about where we want to be and how we can guarantee that we have all of the factors, all the variables in place so that we can make that energy transition possible. 
So uh, as we sit here and record our conversation today, we see the headlines of the morning about uh, Apple coming up 10 million short on its 90 million projected needed supply of new iPhones. Uh, we see the, the president uh, with meetings about the port of Los Angeles and other things of that nature. Does this tie directly to the types of recommendations you'll be making in the report? I think it ties very closely to the kind of things that we've been discussing, which is that and this is a sort of a, an overall paradigm, I would say, is that government can't solve this alone, the private sector can't solve it alone, any one nation cannot solve it alone. And so what we've done with the case of critical minerals is we've looked at uh, public sector act actions, what the, the US government needs to do, um, what the private sector needs to do, and then what needs to happen, not just within the United States, but internationally. And some of the most important of those recommendations, um, I think are, uh, are actually transferable from one sector to another. Uh, you know, recognizing the link between critical minerals and our geopolitical ambitions is one of them. That's a critically important step for us to, to take so that we can take this issue seriously. Um, prioritizing the development of resources here in the United States, as well as the processing and refining of those things. Uh, making sure that we have the human capital available to do these things but also making sure that we make it easier for companies to do business, you know, streamlining the permitting process. Um, and with the in the case of critical minerals, maybe we need to consider uh, the stockpiling of those critical minerals to make sure that we have access to them in times of need. The private sector needs to do its, do its part on human capital, investing in new technologies, uh, making sure that they have a long-term approach to their in their investment decisions, not just focusing on sort of the next 12 months or the next shareholder meeting and understanding how their work actually contributes to this clean energy future that we've been talking about. I, I'd like to take a moment though, John, and just focus on one of the, what I think is the most important recommendation that we have in this report, which is actually that the United States has to work with its partners and allies to fix the problem. This is not something that the United States can do on its own. Part of it is about making sure that we have access to uh, resources. Part of it is about having access to processing and refining facilities in other countries. But it's also about creating global standards and making sure that uh, we have the most powerful nations in the world coming together to agree upon a set of norms and standards uh, for a global regime that emphasizes environmental, social governance issues, those ESG issues that we've often talked about, and with a particular focus on transparency and disclosure. That's one thing that our stakeholders emphasized over and over again. They want to be held to the same standards uh, here in the United States as they are in other countries, which means trying to make sure that US standards are internationalized to some, to, to some degree. When we look at that global picture currently, do we see something that looks more like competition or cooperation? Uh, we see both elements there, John. I mean, certainly there is competition uh, with the Chinese that I mentioned earlier on, but we're also seeing competition with many of our allies just to get hold of the basic raw materials um, to, uh, to, to make mon modern manufacturing possible. Um, but we're also seeing an increasingly collaborative approach amongst the allies. The Europeans are talking with the United States. Uh, the Australians are increasingly coming uh, to around to the idea of a conversation on these uh, critical minerals. And I think that that's really where we're moving. We're moving towards a, uh, a united uh, approach by the United States and its allies and friends. On the other side, I think we're going to see a China that is going to push back increasingly. We've seen recent moves, for example, by Chinese firms trying to expand lithium production by taking over uh, mining interests in Mexico, uh, which should be sort of within the United States sphere of influence, if we could use that term. So, Duncan, uh, the report talks about uh, increasing demand and years of neglect when it talks about how we got to where we are today. The increasing demand part is easy to understand, right? But that's what, what seems to go along with increased demand is increased production. Why the neglect? Why has that factored into the equation? So I think that for too long, um, we've been focused on many of the positive elements of globalization and an assumption that it doesn't really matter where things are produced as long as we can get hold of them. What the past 18 months or so have shown us is that in times of crisis, 
that access can be highly restricted. And so what the pandemic really made clear to so many of us was that we need to have alternatives. We can't just depend upon the globalized system of production uh, and supply chains. We need to make sure that there are economic as well as political arrangements in place that guarantee access when things get tough. And I think that's really where we are today. There's a realization on the part of, first of all, the Trump administration, now the Biden administration, that we need to come up with uh, backup options. It's not that we're rejecting uh, the global system. It's that we need to make sure that that global system is much more resilient. So taking very concrete steps, like making sure that ports are open 24 hours, uh, making sure that there are agreements between countries to allow access to uh, natural resources um, and to ensure that there are uh, open borders for these kind of things is, is vitally important. So you have recommendations for government, for the private sector, for the international community. What's next? What's the plan for rolling out the report and, and who will you get it to? Well, first of all, we've been working with a lot of the stakeholders that were involved in our conversations and our dialogues, and they're helping us to identify uh, the sort of the, the targets uh, for getting this mm -hmm. document uh, out there. We're working, of course, with our Congressional Relations Office here at the Wilson Center um, to think about uh, which uh, representatives and senators' offices um, would benefit most from having this document at their door. Um, but we're also talking to uh, the private sector itself and, and talking about presenting this at mining conferences, for example, because we want to spread the word far and wide. And you know, just one last point, we're not just focusing here on the United States. We're looking, of course, at, uh, um, at partners in Canada, Mexico, and beyond to make sure that we can actually uh, help people to understand what the conversation is here in Washington about supply chains and how these ideas that we've come up with could be part of the solution. Well, I, I can't imagine there won't be a, a very eager audience for what you've developed here because it's a, a problem that affects the entire globe. You know, when you were describing those supply chains as being global in dimension, I was picturing the globe with lines circling it in all directions. You know, we're not just talking about trucks on the interstate from from Boston to New York. We're talking about something that moves around the planet. Yeah, we're, we're talking about things that, that, that have to move incredible distances um, where there are extraordinarily um, narrow choke points um, you know, that we've seen, whether it's uh, you know, the, the Suez Canal or whether it is the Panama Canal or whether it's the Port of Los Angeles, Long Beach, et cetera. We see that happening on a, on a daily basis right now. We're also very interested, John, though, in understanding not just the challenges that face us today, but what's really over the horizon. Mm -hmm. And our supply chains project moves on next to discuss the semiconductor supply chain, which has been such a hot topic now for many, many months. And what we're going to be looking at there is not so much understanding what the supply chain looks like today, but trying to think about the potential challenges that are around the corner. Those are environmental challenges. Those are challenges of market risk. They're challenges of geopolitics. And they're challenges to do with, are we actually prepared in terms of human capital, infrastructure, to actually produce the right kind of semiconductors for what we need, not just today, but five years from now? Well, it's exciting work, Duncan, and congratulations on getting to this point in the project. Uh, there's barely a human being alive on the planet who isn't affected by this. So uh, for people who'd like to see the report, other than those targeted audiences you talked about, how can they find it? Well, it's available on our website. Um, it's actually right now on the, uh, the homepage of the Wilson Center. But uh, all you have to do is just to look for critical minerals in the search function of the Wilson Center's website, and you'll see it right there. Um, and of course, we'll be, uh, we have a, an entire social media campaign where we'll be putting the word out there with links to that document. And uh, I just encourage the people who are seeing this video to keep following our work um, on supply chains, because this is a project which uh, is going to remain relevant for years to come. Supply chains challenges are not going away anytime soon. Well, thanks for being on top of them. And that's, that URL is wilsoncenter.org. So Duncan, thanks very much. Thanks, John. And thanks to all of you for watching. We hope you enjoyed this edition of Wilson Center Now, and that you'll join us again soon. Until then, for all of us at the Center, I'm John Molesky. Thanks for being here.